is up, everybody? Welcome back into Debate Night. We are back yet again, winding down the last few episodes of the season, getting to the end of the road, but we still got some great debates to take place here on the channel before the end of our uh, second season here doing this this here format. So without further ado, let's get into it. We've got a new, uh, a new host today, um, but Brody's here as well. Man of the people. Yeah, I'm back after you guys had your little uh, tea party or whatever that was last week. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Um, (laughs) But uh, yeah, man of the people here. Got to go with the top comment from last week. And, uh, you know, if you don't agree with it, then you should have liked other comments to make it the top comment. Uh, This from Lap. He says, this is like a, a conversation. Terry, this is what Terry's saying. This is way out of character for him. Jonathan is what Jonathan's saying. Yeah, I've literally been doing this for years. So that was the top <laughs> comment. Congratulations, my friend, man of the people. Yeah, there's uh, still continuously a lot of uh, chatter about that whole situation for mm. sure. Uh, Terry put himself in the uh, the line of fire on it's, that one. Well, it's tough when you're trying to say stuff just to have the majority agree with you. And they don't. And then they don't. So <laughs> yeah, then you I'm have gonna... to go to the other side and then you try to find where the line is. Yeah, you're better off just saying what you actually believe in at the yeah. end of the day, folks. Yeah. Um, well, like I mentioned before, we have a, a new guest today, um, needed a last minute substitution. Caleb found him on Twitter. We brought him in. He's brave in it. Um, tell me what you're about, Caleb. What, what are you bringing to the show tonight? Well, I'm bringing some hot takes and I will not be pandering like Terry. I can tell you that for free. Um, I was, uh, one of the team captains, the vice president for the Mississippi state disc golf team. So I am, uh, at least that familiar with this golf, whatever's that worth, whatever that's worth. Uh, and I look forward to hopefully hurting Brody's feelings along some, some manner of well, disc golf related topic. Fun fact about Mississippi state, their ultimate Frisbee team is called uh, dark horse. They so are called dark, dark horse. Wow. And after Dave's dark horse tavern, great How pizza, phenomenal that? pizza. If you're in Starville, go to Dave's. <laughs> How about that? Shout out Dave's and um... Shout out Dave's. that's where we got button league. There you go. Um, we also got some uh, some veterans here to to provide some competition. Gary is here. Yeah, I, I thought a lot about it. I've weighed the options of both sides, and I got to say I'm coming out on Team Trevor for the rock debacle. So Thank goodness. Thank goodness. I, I need all the support I can get. Um, the heck does that say? Yeah. Are you, uh, not, are you not caught up on all the, the drama, Brody? I haven't caught up yet. What, you want to fill mm-hmm. me in real quick? Well, <laughs> we had a whole segment on it on grip lock, but basically Hunter bullied me, took my favorite disc hostage and dipped the entire thing in ranch dressing, which is like my least favorite. Oh, I did see Earth. that. Yeah. I did see that. Yeah. So that's where we're at with that. Yeah. Um, uh, real quick for everyone. That's like, I, for all you people out there being like, you have to be good at disc golf to have a, a, a take or for your take to make sense. I got the pleasure to play with Gary. Gary's actually good at disc golf. Yeah, it's Gary, true. I, th- I did not think you were going to be good at disc golf. You actually are surprisingly good. At disc golf. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a fair thing to say. There's just, I, I don't know. I just didn't assume anyone on the show was going to be good at disc golf. Gary's good okay. at disc golf. Well, what about Mike? Mike, are you good at disc golf? Yeah, what the heck? What's going on here? <laughs> are you, I haven't seen you play, Mike. Are you good? Uh- I'm extremely Don't tell average. me your rating. Don't you dare. I'm, ex- I'm extremely average at disc golf. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. Well, Brody, how, how do we figure this out? We need a system. We need a number or else how are we going to know? Mm. Uh, I will fly to you and I will watch you play and I'll tell you whether you're good or not. Is that, could you say like, that's your rating? It's just good or bad. Yes. <laughs> you're either, you're either good, bad, or I'm, I, I'm too nice to actually tell you what you're at. Mm, okay. There you go. Who will be the first one on the Brody rating scale? Um, in the any people's case, ratings. Yeah, the people's ratings. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's hop into our topics of discussion. We're going to talk a lot about um, GMC and kind of the uh, the state of disc golf as we're at after that event. Um, starting with Gannon Burr. So Gannon Burr has continued his historic season with yet another win at GMC. Uh, here's what I want to know because I'm seeing a lot of chattering in Twitter. So there's a lot of people I think that aren't huge fans of Gannon, um, even though I think 
he does have quite a few fans as well. So I want to know, is he the right figure to bring the sport notoriety in an era of dominance? This is kind of like how people would say Paul Macbeth did it, or does he lack the marketability and would the division be better off without a prominent dominant player to push popularity forward. So would we be better right now just having, instead of Gannon Bird dominating, having a lot of parody, a lot of players pushing for the top. I think um, certain people who didn't like Gannon were certainly voicing that opinion, whereas we have seen the sport grow through single player's dominance. So that's kind of what I want to get your take on. Brody, do you think Gannon is somebody who can push the sport forward by being dominant? Well, this is an interesting question because you say, you know, we've saw the, the sport grow through player don't i don't think we did i don't i don't think random people are all of a sudden picking up the frisbee wow. because Paige pierce was dominating or paul Macbeth was dominating or ken climo was dominating like until i see articles being written or players showing up on media outside of the disc golf world it's just natural growth right like the thing that the thing that grew disc golf the most out of anything was a a virus that that that's what actually grew disc golf the most. So this notion that disc golf has all this, like if you, if you had the right person in disc golf that was dominating, that disc golf would blow up. Like, I don't remember seeing Paul Macbeth or Paige Pierce on any sort of like interview. Now, obviously, yes, sports center. We've seen those top tens. I'm going to be honest with you guys. There's a lot of sports that I've watched that pop up on sports center, top tens and stuff. I don't think that really does anything like it's not all of a sudden me looking at that being like, Oh, I want to go and pay attention to that sport. Like if I asked you for right now, what is the biggest name in lacrosse? Would anyone be able to tell me? Not Paul Rabel anymore. Paul Rabel. No, he doesn't play. <laughs> You're tired. <laughs> but you see what I'm saying? Like what's, what's if I, if I didn't say a big top four sport, like who's the biggest uh, female skateboarder? Yeah, when it's outside of your sport, no one flipping knows. Hey, so this, points. so so that's my whole thing. Is like I, I think there's a crazy thing saying like, is he the right figurehead? We haven't had anyone that has done a Tiger Woods that has gone outside of the sport of golf and have brought in people in yet. That person doesn't exist yet. Okay, okay, valid points. I, I see, I see that take, Caleb. What do you think? I completely disagree because I played my first round of disc golf after Paul's 18 down at Deagle. Just straight up. There was a nine hole course at the college I went to. And that's my first round of disc golf was after I saw Paul shoot 18 down at D-Glow. Um, but going back to Gannon, though, I, I think Gannon is the right guy for the job, not exclusively because we do have a good cast of characters for him to work with. But I do think he's the right guy for the job because who's who's the better alternative? He's young. He's charismatic. He handles himself well on the course. He's relatable. He's a 19 year old that spends half of his. He's probably got seventy thousand dollars worth of Legos just from this year. So. <laughs> If you, I mean, you watch all of his vlogs, you see how goofy he is. He's the right guy for that kind of role for this generation of up-and-coming up disc golfers. And I don't think he's doing it exclusively through dominance, though. Uh, when you look at his wins this year, he's had three that he blew people out of the water. But he's won by one stroke at Waco and Beaver State Flame, two strokes at Memorial uh, European Open, d And he had one-stroke losses at Texas State and Las Vegas, three-stroke losses at DDO and Des Moines. It's not like he's just blowing guys out of the water every time he wins. He's bringing electricity to the field. It's not like the field is just trying to catch up to him every week. Uh, you know, there, there will be a whole generation of players who sees Gann the same way that I saw Paul. Like, I still throw Thunderbirds and Rocks because of Paul. Uh, there's going to be a whole generation that sees him like that. I don't think there's a better character to push the sport forward. And if we see crazy stuff like that happen, there's going to be times when he does something crazy and he just pops up in the random YouTube algorithm and someone sees it on YouTube. Like I saw Paul Ziegler, 1800. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Good points. Uh, Gary, what do you think? Yeah, I think if you approach this from a conversation of skill, he's absolutely the person to propel the era of dominance for it for new fans and new players. And it's because he's young. He's arguably going to keep improving. And I think he showed us that he can chase down leaders. He can be the leader and, and he can battle through adversity. The question of his marketability, that's no doubt. He definitely is marketable. He's got a personality on and off the course. He's never boring and he already splits opinion. So he already has both hero and villain vibes, which is great. And he's willing to speak his mind. But to address the last part of the question of like, why would we ever want to see a dominant player not be on tour? You know, we might buy ourselves a season or two of parody, but we're stunting the growth of the sport if we remove people like Gannon, because how many crazy talents join the sport because of Kenny? 
how many people joined the sport because of Paul and how many are going to follow in Gannon's footsteps. And, you know, people talk about it being boring that he wins so much. Were people saying the same thing about Paul back in 2015? I mean, what did Paul have that Gannon doesn't? Maybe a rival? Um, I think Paul and rookie rivalry, that it got everyone out to watch the battles every weekend. I think about like Clyde Drexler and, and Michael Jordan and Peyton Manning and Tom Brady, where it's a little bit more of a one-sided rivalry, but it's still a good rivalry nonetheless. And I think Gannon doesn't really see his competitors that way. You know, would Paul be out filming a, a video with Ricky where they throw ice cream at each other? No, <laughs> but I'm not saying Gannon needs to treat everyone differently or he needs to suddenly get super serious about stuff. But as he continues to dominate, I think, you know, it's good to see a young guy having fun and grinding it out to sharpen his game week in and week out. And I think he's a good model for new players in the game. Yeah, valid point. The only thing stronger than a dominant player is a rivalry. I think I agree with that. Uh, Mike, where are you at on this one? I'm going to audible my answer a little bit just to touch on some of the comments. I, I agree with Brody in the sense that it doesn't really matter how good someone is. We're not going to get a ton of outside people, but I do think it's relevant because there are a decent amount of people who casually watch Jomez who are sort of in the disc golf space, but not quite there. And I do think having a dominant figure like a Paul, like maybe a Gannon now, I do think it's more than zero affecting the amount of people who jump into that and take it more seriously. Uh, I mean, dominant players are important to sports, especially individual sports. When you look at golf, like when it was at its peak, obviously at Tiger Woods, um, it gets young kids to idolize players and decide to take the game more serious. And I think that's like the important part is taking the casual to the serious. When you see a young kid like Gannon doing that, that's going to make them do that. Uh, as far as if Gannon's best for the job, I kind of disagree with some of the stuff that's been said. I, I don't really think he's the ideal candidate. Combine his slow play with like, I, you guys, I, his social media is pretty lackluster. I mean, he's on Alden's blogs or vlogs, but those really don't get that much traction other than hardcore disc golfers. And they're not Gannon's. I mean, he's just in them. His Instagram is just full of the very, I did this, I got this place, like great tournament. He's not doing much other than that, but there's hope. He's 19. He's probably not thinking about his brand and getting it bigger in all the ways he can make money outside of winning because all he's doing is winning. So I think in the next few years, if he took it seriously and got his brand kind of the point where it could be, I do think he potentially could become that best person. Um, but the question of if the dominant person is important or not, of course, it's important. Can I throw a rebuttal? Sure. Because I think this is an interesting topic. Um, like, I think, real quick, I think Chris and Tatar. I said, like, that we haven't had that person yet. I actually think Kristen Tatar is doing that. She's doing it more on the European side of things, though, and in her country where she is doing events. She's in um, marketing things that are outside the realm of disc golf that might get eyeballs, people looking in. I thought when I, when I read this question initially, I thought this was talking about, like, sport no notoriety to, like, sport fans, not disc golfers. Right. Like, I don't think we're trying to get like a, a, a guy that already knows who disc golf is. Um, that, that's how I read it. Um, but real quick, I, I, I do want to rebuttal with Caleb. Caleb, what? So what year did you start playing then? 2018. OK, so you didn't know anything about disc golf or Frisbee or anything. I would play ultimate with some buddies on the soccer field after after school. So you threw the fr you've thrown the Frisbee before, though. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then you saw that disc golf existed because of Paul, and then you started playing disc golf. Basically, yeah. Gotcha. Okay. And yeah. I would like to say something too about. Yeah, I think I just think that connection. I think we have to have that context because I, I would love to know how many people that have never thrown a frisbee before saw that video and said, "I'm going to pick up a frisbee and throw it." I, I don't know that playing time. ultimate once a week. Really, uh, yeah, I don't feel like that's super relevant. No, no, it definitely is. What are you talking about? There is a huge okay. connection between th playing ultimate frisbee and throwing a frisbee sure, and disc sure, golf. But there's there's millions of people who have played disc golf one time with a friend, never think about it again. There's millions of people who saw one Jomez because of some random algorithm that pulled them in potentially. Like to say that you have to have never seen disc golf or know what it is to have no, this no. count. That, I don't think that makes sense. No, that's, like, not my, that's not my point. My, my point, my point being like, I don't think my point being is like what you were just saying. There's millions of people that do that. There's millions of people that play that go bowling too, that don't have any intention of playing or watching bowling professional bowling. Sure. But there, if there's a YouTube video of Pete Weber, who you think you are, I am that surely made someone take bowling more seriously. When they were casual prior, I, 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 but but to your point, what you just said, 
Pete Weber, in my opinion, would go in that list of Tony Hawk, would go in that list of Tiger Woods, go in that list of, um, I'm blanking on his name. Oh, my God. The surfer. Help, someone help. Help. Line, Slater. Line. Slater. Course, thank Slater. you. Like, those guys go in that list. You know Tony why? Slater. Because Slater. he was in TV shows. He was in marketing, advertising. He was in all these other things. So you just, like, literally said a person. Who have we? Who has had that happen in disc golf? No, I, I, That's I my hear point. you. We have YouTube and I think videos. It's a smaller That's scale, but I disagree because there's a smaller scale. All my friends know I disc golf. Some of them have never disc golfed, and if they try to talk to me about it, there are some who know who Paul McBeth is. They know his name. I don't know how, but they do. So I, I disagree with that. Well, it depends. I mean, it's, not, yeah. and it's not to the scale it's, as those other people. I'm, of course I'm just, not. That's all I'm saying is I don't think we've had someone that has broken out and has shown up on big media outside of disc golf that's all i'm trying to say i yeah. I, I get that yes paul's video has a lot of views uh, there's also shots i think nate sexton has an ace that's very very popular yeah. mm -hmm. there's the guy that has the ace that's off of the santa monica bridge there's a lot of clips of disc golf that has been viral if you will and has gotten out there i'm just saying i don't think there's a personality yet that has captured the masses in sport like some of these other sports. We don't have that yeah. person yet. <laughs> Caitlin Clark is that person for the WNBA yeah, that, right now. Basically, yeah. That what you're describing is impossible for disc golf at this point. I don't think it's impossible. No. Yes. Yes. Because like the sports you're describing had no. way larger I'm player honest, bases. I still like, disagree with this a lot. Like Joe Mass has more subscribers on YouTube than P than PBA bowling does. Like I, I understand that disc golf isn't as well known, but this is all to scale. Like Paul is our Tony Hawk. Paul is our Kelly Slater. It's a smaller scale, of course. M less people know him, of course, but we're also a much smaller sport. So in ratio to how big our sport is to those other sports, he is transcending disc golf and people I'm, know him I'm not, of not playing disc I'm golf. Not, I'm not disagreeing that like Gannon Burr's doing the same thing in disc golf. That's not what I'm disagreeing with you at. I'm saying we haven't had a player that, that has the personality that has gone out. Like another pl person, Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor made UFC so much more popular because of his personality and because right. of his the, fighting the sports, style. The sports that you're naming, my point was the sports that you're naming already had large platforms. UFC, like skateboarding, before, not really with Tony Hawk, but it was. But skateboarding was done by a lot of people all over the country, way more than disc golf for a Everybody longer time. Everybody knew what skateboarding like, was. Everybody knows what bowling is. There's right. still a large force people that there's, don't know what disc golf is. There's a there's a lot of there's yeah. a lot less awareness with disc golf. I don't think Wouldn't it has. That make my point. When it, disc golf is in its infancy, and and I agree with Brody that we haven't had anyone who's been able to transcend. That's all I'm trying to say. Sport, yeah, we haven't. Had, world. Yeah, I disagree with your point. Gotten. I'm just saying that what you're describing, that person, like I don't think that person could exist in the with the level of that disc golf is at right now. We don't have the personalities in disc golf for that I, yet. I, I mean, think not even, it, I, you got the most electric best player yeah. of all time right now in disc golf. The like, picture your perfect disc golfer personality player. I don't think they could actually get to like a national media level. I don't think it's, it's are possible. you saying it? Okay. So you're saying you're saying, cause it's very simple. If you look at like uh ultimate Frisbee right now, they have Marquez Brownlee, right? Who's the biggest name in YouTube tech, right? I say that's, massive, yeah. massive. Right. And he posts stuff about him playing ultimate Frisbee that gets thousands and thousands of interactions, millions of views on his Instagram and Twitter. Yeah. But I would, I would say the same thing of like, I don't think that's really making ultimate Frisbee always all of a sudden, like a must see kind of, I need to pay attention. I need to watch. I think he's gotten more people into it for sure. But you're just saying like ultimate Frisbee, the sport itself isn't ever really going to get anywhere, regardless say, of who you have. Not ever. Same with, same with disc golf. Uh, not, not ever is all I'm saying. I'm saying right now it doesn't have the legs. Like you could literally, you could take somebody with like unlimited charisma and personality and, and could be winning every single one event in our sport. And I don't think it would emerge like a Tony Hawk character. Like our sport just doesn't have the legs for that at this point in time. Like what so, if, I think huh. like to Mike's that's, point. That's an interesting question, actually. That's to Mike's point, we have we have guys like Paul McBeth who are able to create a little bit of that wave, but I, I don't think that disc golf had like like the WNBA. Everybody know everybody's known about the WNBA for a very long time. We obviously all know basketball, so all it really took was a big push by the media to really get that in front of people. Um, but the media isn't going to get behind disc golf in that way. 
Like there, there's always two, there's an agenda with a lot of times with the stuff they're pushing the WNBA, you know, that's owned by the NBA there. There's like a lot of incentives going on. Whereas yeah, and- disc golf, like what would be the reason for them to get behind it? The reason would have to be if the sport was a huge popular sellable thing, which for example, we just saw that with pickleball and how many pickleball personalities uh, emerged at the top. N- none. Like, so I they- guess, I guess my, my only to like put a cap on it. My only argument is goes back to saying like, we haven't had a person doing this yet. Or we haven't had a person like this yet, because if we had, everyone would at least know what all, uh, disc golf was and would make a decision of whether or not they want to pay attention or not. Right. And it, if it- there's people that have no idea what disc golf is, clearly we haven't had a person in our sport that has made it popular enough in the sense of where at least people know what it is yeah yeah it, it comes down to like we said like the scale of what you're looking at whether you're looking at it from a comparing it to all the big sports that have had like the conor mcgregor's or if you're looking at it more within disc golf and just like who has kind of poked their head almost outside of the bubble a few times like oh there was an article in the news about paul's new contract or hey they were on espn like that that's like that's where the different scale is but- maybe that's why disc golf needs to go to the olympics Hey, maybe because no one was no, no one really like knew that much about curling until the United States who was talking about that that run for this year, you know, it also let the record show that uh, Brody's uh, 90 seconds validated my pick for the COVID germ on the, uh, the Mount Rushmore. That is true. COVID on the route. Mount Rushmore. COVID COVID, COVID blew up the sport more than anything else that that I don't think anyone can, can uh, argue that. Um, All right, we're going to move on to some FPO talk. So FPO at GMC saw yet another lead collapse late in the tournament, this time at the hands of Silva Sarnin. The benefactor, Kristen Sitar, once again. So what I want to know is, do tournaments like this hurt the perception of Kristen's legacy when they are handed to her in such a dramatic fashion, or do you see them as an example of Kristen's consistency? I think a lot of people have kind of leaned towards the consistency, but I'm curious to see if that's shifting at all, because I feel like, especially lately and when it happens in such a dramatic fashion, like, can you really look at that and not see it as a tournament being handed over, and and how often does that happen? Uh, Caleb, what do you think? Yeah, so talking about whether it diminishes her legacy, absolutely not in my eyes. Here's what we'll remember three years from now. That in a three-year span, and this is just the past couple of seasons, in three years she won six majors and half of the events she played in. That's what we'll remember. We don't talk about last year at Waco when Ella choked and Kristen came back and caught her. I think part of this comes from the fact that there's this misconception about Kristen that she has to be a front runner, that she has to get a big lead, and she only wins when she's absolutely dominating. But that's not really even true. Uh, we, we've seen her come back at events before. And even then, talking about last weekend, why didn't Owen, Stock, Owen Scoggins catch back up? Owen went three over in the same stretch that Silva went three over. Owen could have come back and won the same way that Kristen did. If Owen goes one under during that last five-hole stretch, she goes into the playoff with Silva and Kristen. And she may have won. And if she did win, all we'd be talking about is, wow, Owen went on this great run at the end of the tournament and came back and won a playoff event and that's that's all it would be but when it's Chris it's a different conversation I don't know that it's really fair because we don't hold other greats to that same standard think about Paige how many times has Paige won just because other people choked think 2022 Champions Cup is the best example of this Kristen choked at the end of the round Paige came in and won we don't talk about that. We don't think about that affecting Chris uh, Page's legacy at all. So I don't think it's really fair to say that just because we've seen this happen a few times where the person that's leading just couldn't hold it down, that that somehow negatively affects Kristen's legacy when we've seen her be so dominant otherwise. Okay, okay. Quick to defend Kristen. Gary, are you in the same boat? I think this is all about Kristen's consistency and the FPO's inconsistency. You know, Kristen has never been one to play very aggressive to fight back. She typically likes to linger and wait for you as a player to open the door for her. And then she kind of slides right through because she consistently takes advantage of the lack of consistency in the FPO field. Um, I would argue that she doesn't even like to take risks when she gets these comebacks because the birdies that she gets are birdies she already planned on getting. You know, proof of that is in hole 16 this past weekend when she didn't really have to push. She just opened the playbook on 16, said lay up. She did that all three rounds and she she did what she had to do. Um, and she can do that because, like I said, there's a lack of consistency in the FPO field because, you know, we've seen this time and time again this year, you know, with Holland at Worlds and OTB and Music City. Own collapsed at Des Moines, Portland, and the third round of Waco. Evelina tried to give away the Champions Cup, and she blew it at the USWDGC. 
Cat Merch blew it at Austin, and Ella and Holland gave it away at chess.com. That's 11 events where somebody either completely botched a lead or dropped out in the final round to make it a runaway win for somebody. And so every single time an FPO player this year has been able to put together in a tournament where they played decently every single round, they've kind of won. And so it shows that Kristen is a phenomenally consistent player, and that's all you really need to win the FPO division right now. And some semi-decent putting. But I think that's why Kristen dominated the field last year. And it's also why sometimes when she doesn't play as consistently this year, it we feel it more. Because she's the consistent one amongst a field of inconsistency. Okay. Okay. So still kind of riding with the inconsistency. Mike, do we see that consistency as a attribute? Or do you feel like that creates some overrating narratives? What do you think? Sure. Well, the first thing I'll say is whether it's fair or not to her to nitpick like this that's just the way it is when you're maybe the goat when we're talking about the best players you, we have the luxury of nitpicking that's just kind of how sports works uh it certainly doesn't help her legacy uh she's always been successful because she makes very few mistakes and she's consistent i mean we've seen this year last year every once in a while but mostly this year that if she falls behind she oftentimes doesn't have the firepower to claw her way back up if her competitors are playing well it's great that she's consistent but it just makes a weird feeling, a weird taste in your mouth because consistency should be a trait possessed by the top 10 or 20 players in the division, not just one player in the division. Uh, when we look at the other three players that were in contention going into the final round, Owen and Missy shot their worst rounds of the event, the final round, and Silva played her worst stretch of four or five holes of anyone to end the event. So we can't even blame it on the intimidation factor of Kristen anymore. Like to give her credit, we can't do that as many as multiple times this year. We've seen the hot potato act when she's not even in the mix uh, to, to the earlier points when his, uh, when history buffs look back, they're not going to remember uh, like how easily these were given to her and they're just going to see the wins and that's fine. And I also think it's important to mention like Paige didn't have great competition either. So we can't, really look at that we can just look at the wins i don't think it hurts her long-term legacy but in the short term like narrative it definitely doesn't help yeah yeah it is difficult to see what it'll be like uh long term versus what we're seeing right now when there is a lot to nitpick like you mentioned uh brody what do you think yeah I, i'll agree with these guys uh but i think the caveat is because of the, the tournament right so playoffs I, again i don't know what we want to talk about with that when they're just letting anyone in but Non-major tournaments, I think a win is a win. No one's really going to go back and look at it. So how they won, you know, she's won so many events. They're, they are going to forget kind of how this got, to, you know, down the road. However, like the Ella collapse at Waco, like if that was a major, that will get highlighted so much more. We see that in other sports. When, when teams collapse, whether it's in a series, whether it's at the end of a game. I mean, I remember the, the Falcons Patriots game that I went to that Super Bowl. like that will always be talked about. Also the uh, British major, I can't remember his name. I'm blanking it on. It's the Spaniard guy, but the whole Creek fiasco at the British major, they show that almost every single time the open is coming around. So the big tournaments, we will notice these, the, we will notice these, but the other thing I want to say too, is like going back and watching the coverage. I read this and I read this uh, question before I watched the coverage and um, I don't think Silva actually really choked that much. Like Kristen actually played really, really well. Silva missed a couple, a, a close putt, the putt on 18. That's kind of 50, 50, but like, it wasn't like a, it wasn't as bad as other things. Like the, the tee shot on 18. Sure. Would love to see that get in bounds. That is a difficult tee shot though. And she just made the mistake. I think at the end of the day, she made the mistake of not wanting to go OB right. And she uh, sawed it off a little bit and went OB left, but I don't know. I've seen, I've seen a lot worse chokes. I would say than, than that from Silva. I don't know if I've seen many worse chokes. I have very seen short, a lot more. Very short putt missed on 15. Awful drive on 16. It was a 20 still, foot putt. 20 foot putt fail. on 16. Got to make it. Still, still fails to, to get so up well, and down. Um, and then, wait, wait, and then go, go through what you're saying again. Go ahead. 15. Bad Miss, shot. Misses the That's where she misses the really short putt, right? Or set 16, where she missed the short putt. 15, she hit a tree early. That was really bad. Right. Early. That's the early tree. 16, that was really bad, but that can happen on that hole. Is where she, that's where she throws the awful tee shot. And I then say awful. the short putt. It was I wouldn't say awful. horrendous. It was literally a spike hyzer into the woods on the left. It was, I wouldn't say it's awful. It, was, it still it was, got down the fairway decent amount. <laughs> very bad. Um, and then well, there's nothing else to hit. And then on 18. And that is a tight gap. 
Listen, she bogeyed three out of the last four holes. All she had to do was make pars. Like the, it's that it was a bad, it was a bad choke. I, I, I'm just saying we've seen worse. It wasn't like she just all of a sudden forgot how to putt. I think it wasn't think like she seen, was just chucking shots all over a, the place. I think we've seen more egregious shots thrown via via choking, but the collective of holes and how big her lead was, she had a six shot lead on the T of 14. Like that's that's pretty bad. No, I, I, I'm not saying that she didn't, she should have, have won that. All I'm saying is I don't think her, which choke, choke do you think is, is more no, is more notable. I, I think when it's, when it's like a player doesn't really have to do anything on easy holes or they can't putt like, like Evelina choking European open. That's well, see, a choke. But that's, see, that's someone that just completely you, all of a sudden forgot how to play this putt already. That's just who you are. Silva was putting lights out all day. She was throwing lights out all day. And then what happens when she gets to the final five holes forgets how to play disc golf. Like that's a choke. It's not when you're just already a bad putter and you just get highlighted on the last. She few still holes. was throwing. Um, all I'm saying she still was throwing decent shots. 17 is a hard, uh, is a hard tee shot. She threw it to where she had a chance to make birdie. Uh, 18. That was that's a hard tee shot, and unfortunately, she probably threw the wrong disc. Honestly, it looked like it wasn't super overstable enough. It had way too much like kind of right to left uh, glide or whatever you want to call it. Um, but she still had putts on 17 and 18. She makes those putts. No one's talking about anything, and she didn't. And I know we are. <laughs> no, I know. I'm I, I'm not saying she didn't choke it away. All I'm saying is I have seen where players have literally just handed it to someone else. Kristen still had to play incredibly well. Well, Here's what I will say. Kristen still played incredibly well. Here's what I will say is most of the time, you're right. Most time the the choke happens within like the first eight holes. So yeah. And the, (laughs) and the the person that ends up winning, didn't really have to do anything Mm -hmm. to win. Yeah. Like Kristen, Kristen did play really well down that stretch. Yeah, she did. Yeah. She did what she had to do, but like, I, it was bad. It was bad. I thought it was bad. Um, all right, well, let's talk about these courses. So um, after some some low scoring rounds, many fans are starting to claim that the courses at Smuggler's Notch were playing too soft after Gannon shot 16 under at Fox Run and finished the event at 46 under. Um, obviously, he did win, but quite a bit of low scoring across those courses throughout the field. Uh, do you think they pose enough of a challenge to be up to Pro Tour standard? Is this just a fun low scoring tournament now, or do changes need to be made? Gary, what do you think? Uh, last two last two weeks. These courses are too hard. This is the past week. This course is too easy. Uh, fans are always going to find something to complain about. But I think a couple of facts we have to acknowledge here. Gannon's 4,600 par is absolutely ridiculous because that's the same score in four rounds that Isaac took to win Worlds in five rounds. Um, so when you look at the holes for, for GMC, there are 15 holes at Fox Run that average under par and 16 holes that, uh, at Brewster that average under par. And that's 31 out of 36 holes that average under par. And the five that didn't average under par average less than 0.1 strokes over for par so you, i don't think you can argue that it's not one of the easiest events by par in fact if you look at the holes play this year the only two events they're in that same breath are waco and the open at austin but let me well, explain to you why that's actually a good thing because the playoffs need to provide two things in my opinion that's exclusivity and pressure and when the first round is held at a place like gmc the pros are they have to dig into their toolbox for shot shaping and speed control and gap hitting and i think the easier holes give those fighting for their lives an opportunity to succeed and it puts pressure on those at the top to have to stay consistent because if we just pick the hardest courses the rich only get richer and so now we get to see uh, Alden have to have big pressure on him at MVP. We get to see Calvin lose some ground because he played poorly. And I think this works even better because it's partnered up with MVP because the playoffs now both have a sprint tournament and kind of a marathon tournament. And so I think of it like the GMC is uh, like the Preakness. It's very fast paced, like go, 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 go. MVP is your Kentucky Derby full of history and very iconic. And the tour championship is like the Belmont Stakes where you see who has the legs left to finish it. So altogether, great package. Wow. Triple, triple crown analogy. Beautiful from Gary. That's just, that's poetry in motion. Um, Mike, what do you think about GMC? So I don't like to think, I don't like to look at one round by one player to determine if a course is too easy, uh, but rather event as a whole. Um, when we look at this event, the winner had to average 11 and a half strokes under par to win. And every single round, 10 players shot 10 under or better. At first glance, that seems obviously extremely easy. I personally like harder courses, so I don't love this, but I did some digging. It's kind of hard to like really even find this other than manual looking, but I kind of found the preserve as like one of the other super easy courses. Uh, when we looked at the numbers for that, 
11 and a half under or 11.3 under par per round per winner. So basically identical. And again, just by chance, 10 players each round were 10 under or better. So here's the problem. Gannon won by seven strokes. It, when you look at the preserve, it was close. There was five or six guys all within one stroke of each other at the lead. And Gannon won by seven this event and everyone else is behind. If you take Gannon out, it actually was seven or nine under for each round to win. So Gannon just absolutely blowing up the field doesn't really just make a course too easy when when you take the rest of the field. Now all of a sudden nine under par each round, that kind of lines up with the bottom fourth of the turn of the tour. So I think it's fine. Uh, it's fine to have an event like this. And like Gary said, I think like having something quick running gun to start the playoffs. And then as you go further, it's a little bit more grindy. I think that's fine. Um, I think it's okay to have that balance, but I don't want us just to look at Gannon beating everyone by seven strokes and just going ahead and throwing saying this is way too easy. Yeah, could be could be the same uh, Gannon haters bringing up the core softness argument as well. Um, Brody, do you think the, the course still fits in? Uh, I mean, it's so, man. Uh, you know how I feel about this. I'm going to say this until, like, I, I just think for, for disc golf to have a chance to be – more watchable i i i do think you have to guys are getting too good so courses have to get harder like everyone's going to get better and better and better courses have to get harder like the courses we're playing now are way harder than they were in 2020 when i first started so they have to continue to go we can't like we can't we can't be okay with where the courses are right now right uh gary your numbers were just skewed a little bit just because like of it being a playoff, we're not letting in local mm -hmm. pros and a bunch of that. So that's one thing to take into account of why some of these uh, holes are playing as low as they would. Like, I think, you know, at preserve, there's a bunch of guys in there that are probably blowing up on like hole 18 when a lot of the top guys are getting Eagles on it. So skewed numbers, but at the end of the day, when it really boils down to it, guys, it's like, I, I understand that some people out there do like to see People go super low. I get that. My whole thing is like, I just want to see a challenge. And when you have holes on the course where guys are jump putting their second shot and tapping in for birdie, to me, it's just like, I think it's a disservice to how good these players are. And that, at the end of the day, that's what it boils down to it. There's multiple holes on uh, at Fox Run where almost the entire field is birdying. You might as well not even play that hole. If everyone's burning it, just throw it out. So that's my my take on it more is it's just from a spectator side, I think we're losing being able to see how good these players actually are by putting them on courses that they can just shred. Yeah. And and I, and to me, even if it was 10 under average, 40 under was the winner, I still think that's just too low. I still think that's too low. Yeah, it definitely, there definitely are a lot of courses where you feel that effect of um, they're already trending easy, and then there's a few holes that are just gimmies. Um, Caleb, wrap it up for us. What do you think about the GMC courses? Are they too soft? To a degree, yes. Uh, I would say that the courses could be made more difficult, and that probably would make for a better spectator experience. But at the same time, high scoring can be super awesome. So we just want to go back and look at 2021 Worlds uh, on the back nine of round five. Conrad went seven down. Macbeth went six down. Then we got the holy shot, and that was electric. There was that back and forth. It's like, who's going to fail to birdie first? Everything else was going on, and there's like, who's going to fail to birdie first? And it was electric. It was awesome. Then we got the holy shot because of that, and it was great. Um, at the same time, though, I mean, how much of this just has to be shocked up to the fact that Gannon is just playing absolutely out of his mind, better than – Anything we've seen in a while. We sometimes you got to sit back and let greatness happen. Like in 2022, the European Open, it was Eagle and Paul versus everybody else. Eagle went 42 down, Paul went 41 down, and Kevin Jones in third place went 25 down. The Beast was not a particularly soft course, and Eagle and Paul were just having those having that weekend, and they made everybody else look like absolute chumps. So I, could you add more OB at Fox Run? Yeah, probably, but I don't know that it would make that much of a difference at the end of the day because round two. Eagle's disc where he went where he wanted it to go. He threw it extremely well. The two strokes that kept him from going 18 were missed putts. So, I, you know, it, I don't know if it would have made a difference if you added more B to Fox Run, but uh, could they be more difficult? Yes, but at the same time, stuff like this is just going to happen, and I don't see the benefit in uh, 
getting up in arms when something like this does happen when so much of the tour courses so many of the tour courses are getting so much harder you mean uh gannon not eagle on that last yeah, one gannon. Gannon. Yeah. Yeah. yeah rebuttal there i mean the bit the benefit is to like have an idea of wait a second this this might not be over to have an idea of where players have to make decisions fox run um beautiful course beautiful course not a lot of decision making out there it really boils in th in this caleb this is my crux to, to disc golf the big difference between disc golf and golf and again disc golf came from golf is they took out the decision making golf no matter how good you are you step up to every hole and you have so many different ideas how your ball lands in the grass how the winds there's so many things you have to try to figure out and make a decision disc golf a lot of the courses we play it really boils down to who throws the best who's putting the best spoiler alert no one's doing it better than gannon and Gannon even has said on tour life that he doesn't want force carries. He doesn't want to have to make decisions. He doesn't want to do any of those things because that's an element that he feels that like he's not really good at right now. So the best player in the world is telling you right now, he likes where this golf is because he's the best at it. He's the best thrower. He's the best I, putter. I will say th something that I thought about with this question and just kind of this week in general I love golf and I love when we take things from golf in certain contexts. If golf didn't exist and somehow we just came up with disc golf without golf, would we be like this concerned about these high scores? And the reason I say that is just because I would. it's so hard to add, like you putting's not hard. You can't have rough. You can't do these things. And when we look at other certain sports, Perf perfection and execution is like what makes the sport great. I mean, like bowling darts. I know these are simpler sports. I understand that. But my point is, is like you, I, there's, of course there's ways to make disc golf harder, but bowling, I think they had to make it harder. Just, what's that? Bowling. They had to make it harder. They, I know they, they did, but it's still about like, if, if they don't get a strike, they're upset. Right. So like, it's about yes, perfection, but it is hard to get a strike in bowling because of, of the, because of the oil slick lanes. I mean, it's hard to get a birdie in disc golf. These guys are just really good at it. My point is we might not, That's for whatever reason, get to the point where it's about, like, we, we're not ever going to get to where it's as hard as golf. We're just not. Birdies agrees with me on that, I'm sure. And yeah. I understand adding decision-making, but I think also if we just get to this point that it's just more about execution, I don't necessarily love that, but I have, you have to acknowledge that that might just be what the sport is. So, so the only thing I'll, I'll push back there, just the only thing is I, I, I understand what you're saying. It's not hard to get a birdie. I get it. Like some holes, if you play it really perfectly, it's not hard to get birdie. The problem that disc golf currently has, or sorry, you're saying it's hard to get a birdie. The problem that disc golf has though, is there's a lot of holes where you don't actually have to throw a good shot and you can still birdie. That is the problem in, in golf. If you throw, a, if you hit a bad tee shot, you have to hit a remarkable second shot to get on the green. And then you probably right. have to make a really good putt. But why, you know why is it hard in golf? Because there's rough, because you can't sidestep around a tree. You can't well, shoot also, and curve a shot like you can, but, but it's a lot easier in disc golf. Like there's no, things I, that are in, innately harder in golf. But why, why do we have our bat for, let's just, let's just go there. Like, I know Kayla was saying, I know they could probably make more OB and make courses harder. They could also make the greens way harder. They can make baskets higher. They can make uh half, half of the green covered with trees. So if your disc lands over there, you have to no make the basket smaller. They can make the basket. There's a lot of things they can do without just making artificial. Cause I know people yep. hate artificial OB, but I, yeah. if you look at the other sports that have targets, it's always two. Basketball, no. two baskets, basketballs, golf, two butt balls. A lot of it is two when you have those sports. And then you look at disc golf and it's way more than two. So uh, there are things that they can make it harder. And my whole, my only thing is I just think adding that element, that drama, because we already have taken away the fact of like people having to have touch because they can just throw, throw these overstable discs. So you've already taken that kind of element out. But if you could find a way to make it to where a player steps up, no matter what their skill level, level is, a player steps up on a hole and you think to yourself, they can birdie this hole, they can par this hole, they can bogey it, and they can double bogey it. To me, that makes it a lot more exciting 
than a lot of the holes on Fox run. It's are they going to par it or birdie? To me, that's just less exciting. There's two options. Yeah. Two, two's not as exciting it, as it, three, yeah. four, five. I, yeah. It's think, interesting. Go ahead, Gary. I think I think that's where I have to look at it as a whole like package when it comes to like the playoffs because I think there is value in that idea of a sprint where – even like, you know, you look at people who are running the the hundred meter dash, just having a stride be off is mean could mean the difference between you losing and you winning. Yep. So on occasion, having a course that is a dead sprint for birdies and forcing people to go, yeah, we know you can get these holes. We know you can get all these holes, but can you get them and just keep getting them over and over and over again? I think as it sits as a piece of the playoff, it makes more sense. If this was a standalone, like GMC was its own event. I would be much more willing to go, oh, I, I don't know that I like this. We should probably think about making this a little more difficult. Um, I'd also entertain the idea of making one of the courses a little more difficult than the other. I like that dichotomy of having to go one day and be the best you can be constantly from start to finish. And then the next day having to go out and, and make a lot of decisions. So it's like you're trying to turn off and on different parts of your brain to be a really dynamic player. But it's hard for me to separate one event from the playoff run, but if it's just GMC, I agree with all this. But the thing there, Gary, is like you're literally comparing to a 10 second race that everyone's on their edge of the seat, knowing that anything can happen. Like a bad start could could be the end versus 72 holes where you have Gannon. I mean, incredible round, but Gannon mm -hmm. two pars out of 18. You've got other guys that are getting a handful of par. I mean, they're birding more than half the holes so yeah. and they're doing that over the course of four days that's my if there was a way and this is this is the other thing I'm, I'm with you gary think about how exciting fox run would be if they had uh, let's just let's just use fox run and not use brewster let's say they had four rounds at fox run imagine how exciting that final round would be if they set it up the way that it's currently set up to where you could have a gain around shoot 16 under in the first three days, they set it up to where like the best scores are like five, six under. Mm -hmm. Of where it's like a bloodbath the first couple of days, and then they open up the floodgates on the final round, and guys are just going out and taking birdies. And and the guys early, and this is the other thing too. Imagine that of where the leader is like 15 under par, right? And 10th place, 20th place is 10 under par. And that 10 under guy goes out and he's already through nine holes before the leader even tees off and he's seven under. And mm -hmm. all of a sudden he's tied or he's, you know, he's, he's past, you know what I'm saying? Like that would be kind of interesting. The scoreboard, can he chase down the guys that are to me? It's like, when it's like this, it just boils down to, and it's again, if you like bowling, if you like darts, if you like these sports where it's just like, who can do it the best and there's no decision-making, there's no kind of thought process and the only thing I would say too, look at FPO. I think these courses are designed right now where FPO has to make decisions. Mm -hmm. And look what happens. You see people collapse. You see people make the wrong decisions because yeah. the skill set is perfect for where they are. The skill set is not set up for these for these MPO players. It's not. It's yeah. too easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah. I, there's definitely it's a new new age versus the old school, um, you know, split opinions. Because like I I agree, I I like to see players struggle. I, the most fun I have watching disc golf are the events where guys can shoot like one under or eight under. You know, like there's there's a really big range and there is the potential to blow up a lot. But I think there are a lot of people who are very quick to defend these courses and enjoy seeing the scoring disc golf. And it, it's interesting to 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 hear those different opinions and why people like watching the, the birdie fest. Cause I, I agree. I, I do. I don't mind the occasional sprint. Cause I don't think we get nearly as many of them as we used to on tour. Um, but there is something to be said about the um, kind of flat endings that it can provide. If people are, are able to pull away. Did anyone uh, watch live real quick? Did yeah, anyone watch live? Yeah. How yeah. many, how many times did Gannon like sit over a shot and have to contemplate what to do? Go to None. his bag, change discs. Well, not unless he, not that's, unless he threw that's, off the... that's the wrong person to ask about because he takes a long time. But, <laughs> no, but still, yeah. but still, oh. his, even him, did he was he ever contemplating yeah. shots? Was he ever walking back to his bag being like, ah, should I go for this? Should I lay up? No, not not unless he was off the fairway. Yeah. No, it's, it's I, definitely I do think, straightforward. I, 
I do think Brody makes a really cool point because like maybe we're just too hard on FPO. Like they just have to make decisions and that's what happens because when we look back <laughs> yeah. at like DDO, the year it was so windy and right. we see someone like Paul just absolutely implode <laughs> and nobody shoots well there. because you had to make decisions. Maybe yeah. that would change who's good at disc golf. And hey, that was my Brody best Smith, finish. That was, that was my, <laughs> shocker. That was my best finish ever. Podium Smith. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> when, you had, <laughs> when you actually had to make golf decisions. <laughs> all right. Um, last topic before we hop, hop into our final round. We got another thing to talk about uh, with the GMC, and that's the purse distribution. So purse distribution at GMC being the first playoff event was notably spread evenly uh, with the winner taking home only 15K. And last cash grabbing a pretty pretty heavy six hundred and fifty dollars, um, and then obviously, like I mentioned, it was pretty spread evenly. There wasn't huge drops. So, are you still on board with the Pro Tours per strategy to keep players afloat? Um, is it okay just for the playoffs, maybe because you're rewarding players, or should it change altogether? Because obviously, the Pro Tour has definitely voiced a lot of their per strategy is to try to keep the tour on their feet and um and try to feed the people at the back of the the leaderboard so where are you at with this purse strategy are you still on board do you think this was kind of egregious for a playoff event or actually good uh, mike what do you think this is my favorite question we've ever had uh i'm gonna go a little over you can take points away from me or take it from a different question okay. i was so excited for this question i was ready to rip the tour for the standard pga payouts itd events i never use the standard pga payouts for pros i don't think it rewards high level of play i have a higher drop off the comment about keeping tour players afloat was made back in like 2020 by the disc golf pro tour. So I took a look back at green mountain in 2020 and surprise, surprise, first place, 11.87% last cash, 1.19%. The exact suggested payout for C tiers, B tiers, A tiers, obviously not very competitive in 2022 disc golf pro tour made a change seemingly without telling anyone, at least I didn't know about it from 2022, 2023, 2024, now first place, 19%, last cash, 0.089%. Ladies and gentlemen, few and far between, we copied an already great system, the PGA Tour. PGA Tour from first to 20th, we have the PGA percentage for prize pool copied identically, exactly the same. After 20th, disc golf gets a little bit higher, but that's because we pay less percent of the field than the PGA Tour does. We arguably have a harder, more cutthroat payout than PGA Tour. Uh, most of their events, they pay 48% of the field. The Masters this year, they paid 56% of the field. So I actually like where we're at. I think the prize pool was just a little bit low, which is why it looked kind of strange. But we're actually spreading it out. We're being more cutthroat than we ever were in the last few years. It's exactly the same as the golf tour. And we're actually paying less people than golf. So I'm actually perfectly fine with where it is. And I think the narrative that it's a flat right now isn't exactly correct. Okay, good. Fine, Mike. Love it. Um, Brody, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I agree. I mean, I was going to say something very similar. I think it's I, I think the thing is more about the purse. You increase the purse and all of a sudden you see the winner takes home $1.5 million and last cash, I believe, would be 65000 I think, if I did the math right. Um, and you look at that and you think to yourself, holy crap, like that's a massive difference where 15K to 650 isn't. And this kind of goes back to something I've said at the beginning is like when people talk about like the purse increase, the purse has increased 100%. Well, if the purse was $1 and now it's $2, yeah, it did increase 100%, but no one gives a flip. It's still nothing. So we got to look at the actual numbers here, not just the percentages always. But I agree. And and talk in hearing the people, the, you know, the, I'll say the scuttlebutt on tour, it has never been hard, harder to cash than it is this year. This is by far the hardest time to ever make money. Not only are we shrinking our field size a lot of times because more FPO players are playing, and when you have more, a bigger FPO field, you actually have to have a smaller MPO field. So the amount of people that are getting paid out is smaller, uh, but also these, the players are getting better. So you can't just like have an average tournament in cash. So I, I think it's actually not a bad spot, but like the thing that's missing right now is like the purses are still very low. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Looking for that purse increase is, is definitely still, uh, still a big part of the Real sport. Quick, very, very low in the scheme of like other sports, not very low. And maybe where disc golf is right now. I just want to make that correction. Yeah. Uh, Caleb, what do you think? Yeah, obviously it'd be nice if someone would just write a $10 billion check and we wouldn't have to worry about, uh, payouts 
ever again. We could just watch disc golf and they'd go do their thing. But I, obviously we have to be careful about it if we're talking about any kind of redistribution shift in the pay scale. We don't have to worry about guys like Isaac and Gain. Like Isaac said in an interview that uh, Prodigy's bonus basically matched the $30,000 that he got from the world's payout. I mean, that's awesome. That's crazy. That's cool. Uh, but guys like Joseph Anderson have made $38,000 this year, and it feels to me like it's consistently near the top as he's been for so many events. That should be a little bit higher. So uh, to me, consistency should be rewarded a little bit more, and I think the way we get there isn't so much uh, just redistribution. I think you shrink the payout. I think you go from uh, what was like 40% to maybe closer to 32 and you're concentrating more of – that payout to guys that are consistently playing well. There's a greater reward for um, your individual performance instead of like Greg Barsby made seven hundred dollars. How much is that really doing for him long term? I, I don't see the benefit of probably well, obviously there's benefit to having guys like Greg Barsby around on tour, but <laughs> you, just shifting that a little bit, a little bit up. I mean that makes a whole lot more difference near the top. So I think. Uh, a little bit of redistribution and then potentially just shifting up the cutoff line makes a big difference to the top. All right. Caleb, Caleb's looking for the cutthroat, the cutthroat cut, even, even less cashing, put the money to the top. Gary, what do we think? Yeah. I've always thought we need to really incentivize first place at these events. And I think that the rest of the podium should be well compensated. And I think the top 10 should get, make some solid money too. But after that, the idea of keeping people on tour, I, I don't think it should be a thing. I may lose some, fans with that one but oh, i don't think we're at a point anymore where we can aff- where people just can't afford to be on tour with the the way the top level of skill in disc golf is increasing and the structure of the tour allows pros to skip events it, it puts less pressure on you to go to every single event um plus i think big purses matter a lot like we've talked about here at gmc it was 15k and 10k and that's great but they could have probably got it to 20k and 15k which would look a whole lot better um, and I think big sponsors want to see those big payouts, uh, but I'll say this to address the one part of the question that wasn't really talked about too much is that I think playoffs are the one time where I might be okay with throwing around a little bit more money because if you're going to, um, do it, I think that's the time to do it, but that's only if they get exclusivity figured out, because if you're going to say the top 100, and the top 50, you got to stick to it. Um, and personally, I think it should be less. I think, uh, it should be 75 and 40 at GMC and 50 and 30 at MVP make money and cashing awesome at those events. And for the regular season, I no more popping up, you know, or for giving people money for the cost of travel and stuff like that. Go play eight tiers. Um, <laughs> go figure it out, but let's, let's make the pro tour something to be coveted, to be a part of because the, the everyone's getting so good at this stuff and let's make winning feel like something really, really important. You know, people may tune out to watch Gannon run away with it, but if, if he was putting for 25 K, Maybe that would change their tune. If we want to see the best pros, we have to incentivize them like they're the best. Gary, you want to vomit? Go Good. ahead. I got an email. Oh, I know. I heard. Today. Oh, today? Oh, I got, I'm trying to rope you congratulations. in now. Next one. I got an email today. Hey, you have qualified for the MVP playoff. Can you congratulations. Just send me. I, I, how, how am I qualified for the MVP? I didn't even play in the first playoff. Because I, I showed check up my GMC. spam. I might be on that thing. You might I, be in there. They're, they're, uh, they're asking everyone to play in this. Listen, thing. Brody, if all they want is registration fees, just ask them if me or Hunter can play. Yeah, just get we'll, someone else. We'll bump all the purse um, and we'll, we'll be and, the warm bodies. And it's funny, the, the what you just said, Trevor, I think – the biggest problem with like kind of the small prize pool and like maybe the first place didn't look that great. The biggest problem is the majority of the money we're relying on is the entry fees. Dang it, Caleb, you took my rebuttal. Not what? Caleb, sorry. Not my Caleb. <laughs> so, like, what? So, you got me all like, flustered. I call you the wrong name. When you have only 80 people, I'm sure they're begging 20, 30 more people to come play because that's mm-hmm. paying the top players. Yeah. And yep. if you rely on this house money, you're just never going to get anywhere. Yeah. My, what, right. my, my, what I was going to say too, is that a problem that disc golf currently has is most it's, it's a playing sport, right? So everyone that's watching disc golf plays disc golf. No one's watching pro disc golf that doesn't play. Yeah. So they're pl- a lot of these people are playing in tournaments as well. So they see the p- payouts in these tournaments. They're not that far off. And I'm pretty sure you go to any other sport and you play in like local events. And then you see what the pros are making they're pretty far off. They're not the same. So the fact that you can go and play like an A tier and get pretty close to what some of these guys are making on tour, uh, that to me is also like the issue. I think a lot of people bring up with purses is like 
that gap needs to widen. Um, and that only happens obviously with sponsorships. It shouldn't happen with uh, the player re- registration, but that's where the majority of the money is coming from. Yeah. Yeah. The purses, I don't know. We've talked about it a lot the last few years, but I don't know, you know, I, at the end of the day, yeah, you have to be able to draw in the the sponsorship. I mean, that's, that's just where yeah. the big money is going to come from. And I always said it'd be interesting to see if for one year for like worlds, if they crowdfunded esports did that a while back, Yeah, if they were to crowdfund it and just, you know, Send us sell, money. sell discs or, or whatever, just see what people would get together. I, I'd be curious to know how much they could raise to, to get a really big purse. But now you got to make sure that they don't use that for personal use. You know, you got to yeah, make yeah. sure that money is going actual to the actual yeah. going to the tournament. Um, but please change the name from playoffs. The fact that I can play in the secondary play-ins. playoff event and I wasn't even in, I wasn't even qualified for the first one, didn't play. And now, ons. now I, yeah, what, what are we doing here? Change the name. It's not the playoffs. It's not, Brody, the playoffs. you might get an email to the tour championship. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 I refuse all emails. <laughs> I'm not responding to any of them out of principle. This is crazy. That, it is, it is wild. It's, even though it, I love playing at GMC, those, that, that area is super nice. Yeah, I'd love to play there sometime. And yes, Barsby probably is very happy with the money he won, if that was the question. Uh, <laughs> Vermont is actually pretty expensive. Mm, yeah. Oh, yeah? I mean, unless you're staying in a van. Yeah, well. Like, I mean. if you're staying anywhere near, if you're staying anywhere near the course, you're staying, it's a pretty expensive place up there. So I don't okay. even know if that even covered his his fees, like his expenses There's no for way. the whole week. There's no way. That's, there's no way. No, there's absolutely not. No way. There's no way there's what? No, there's no way it covered. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think he's yeah. happy with the money. Maybe he had a host. You never know. Anyways, um, all right. Finals. Gary, Mike, tied up. So I'm one of you score resetting because um, this is just where we ended up. I think you guys each had a five pointer. It was pretty pretty stellar stuff today. Um, pretty open ended, broad question today. So I'm curious to see what you guys have brought brought to the table. Um, we're going. Super, super introspective. And I just want to know in the past 10 years, we're looking at the past decade, obviously from 2014 to now, um, which individual or organization has made the largest impact on the sport of disc golf other than the disc golf pro tour? I, I admitted that because I thought that would be a pretty popular choice. And I was curious to see if we get a little creative. So, and this is in whichever way you think is important. Um, you can kind of, the impact doesn't have to be financial. doesn't have to be related to growth. You can go any route you want with this um, and then explain why. Um, let's see. We will have, who went first last time? Do you guys remember? I feel like last was, time we went head to head. Yeah. I went first. Okay. So we'll switch it up. We'll let Gary go first this time. Okay. Uh, let's talk about the PDG. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, this is the most I've ever thought about a topic. Uh, I think this was, this was great. And I think there's like three really solid answers, but don't worry. I'm not going to give all three. Um, cause every time I thought about it, it all came back to one. Uh, you know, in, in 2012, there was a man who decided to whip out a camera and film nine holes of disc golf. In 2017, within our 10-year mark, that same man decided to go full-time. And I'm talking about Jonathan Gomez here um, for Jomez Pro. Because we all remember that video in 2017 where, where Jonathan sat down with Michael and Jerry and they announced their full tour. They uh, put out the GoFundMe. They raised just over $5,000. And it was the first time we heard Juiced by Starframe, that classic Jomez Pro iconic song. And that was a moment that would define so much of the future of like disc golf media because suddenly we had an onslaught of different media options. And they provided us the, like the first real tournament coverage with legitimate commentary and like high quality camera work, T cams, catch cams, and, and a graphics package that didn't look childish. And, and also there was an overwhelming outpouring of love for what they bring to the public. Like if you went back and looked at the, the comments on those old videos, people were just gushing at how much they loved it and loved having it. And best of all, it was uploaded to YouTube. So it was free for everyone to enjoy. And so now seven years later and nearly half a million subscribers later, Joe Mez is found themselves on top of the pile and they've, they, they walked so that others could run like gatekeeper media and GK pro and central coast. And I think here's why Joe Mez is the right answer to this question. That's that they brought professionalism to the media of our sport. 
They were the first ones to really do that, do that well. They provided it to the public to enjoy for free. They made disc golf accessible to so many more people. Um, and I think they created standards for coverage that help inform live broadcasting today. Disc golf will never be viewed the same thanks to Jim as pro. And they made attempts to provide media during the off season and the COVID era. And they continually innovated for the sake of their viewers. Live coverage has improved every bit each year because of, um, of Jomez. And even after their partnership and the, the thumbnail debacles, they continue to have the nostalgia every time we hear that. Dun, dun, dun. Hey, yeah, good answer. I was wondering, that was kind of the one I was wondering if either of you two would would pull out because I thought that was maybe would have been my answer. But Mike, see if you can convince me otherwise, unless that was your answer. Well, I have two options here. Okay. I can go with my backup answer and try to win. <laughs> or... I can go with what I know the right answer is, admit second to place, because I'm not going to outdo the same answer and give homage to Joe Mez Pro. It's Joe Mez Pro. It's not close. They've been an extremely important part of disc golf over this time. They impacted growth and visibility more than anyone else, and it's not even close. If you let us pick Disc Golf Pro Tour, I, I, I wouldn't even have thought about it. It's Joe Mez. They're the most likely and most impressive avenue for new people looking into the disc golf on the internet. They won't see Disc Golf Network. They won't see Disc Golf Pro Tour. They won't even know what the PDGA is, but they will see Joma's Pro Channel and the nearly 500,000 subs and 275 million views on the channel. The, access, the accessibility of the content was huge, specifically during COVID. With the influx of new people somewhat interested in Disc Golf, they got pulled in. This was my first and by far the best avenue to view it. You know, Spin TV came around about the same time and they did some great stuff, but time tested. Bar set, everything being said, Jomez is the king of content. You can say what you want about live versus post-produced, but for someone just getting into the sport, which is what this is about, the large impact on the sport, Jomez is the best way for someone to consume disc golf if they're getting into the sport. So it's Jomez. I I I could have I had some backups, like maybe you disc, maybe you could even say like Paul with on the course, off the course. But when it comes down to it, it's Jomez. I'll take my defeat. Congratulations, Gary. I wish I would have went first. <laughs> well, Gary, well, I'm curious to know what your other options were. Yeah, so I, I, I'm in the same line with Mike. Uh, Udisc was definitely up there for me because of how like, it one. defined the way we keep track of the sport. Like, if we're talking about like how it pushed the people, I noticed that you didn't put Entity in there because COVID may have been an answer that I went to. <laughs> yeah. But, but I honestly also thought Paul, but I also had James Conrad in there too because I think the the holy shot, the moment, and what it did to MVP and gave helped MVP get the money to make the waves with Simon and, and Eagle. I think that had a lot of big ripple effects in the sport too. But why don't you think anyone picked that up? Picked, picked what up? Like why didn't James Conrad go on anything? He doesn't even talk to disc golf content, let alone offside. That's a fair. That's just a question. Yeah. No, no. I'm it, the video got shared and posted all over the place. Like, well, I mean, he was on his, like, like the the shot. No, no. Sorry, why didn't he go on a work. podcast? Why didn't he get yeah. interviews? Why didn't he like? Why? Why do you think none of that happened? Do you think I, it literally is just a a one and done situation? Well, that might what? be a, that might be a good example of what I was saying earlier, where like. Yeah that is what, what I meant by disc golf doesn't have the, the legs where like something like that happened, which was so crazy to where it even got featured on pardon my take ESPN, yeah, a lot, of, big, but, up a but, lot of faces, but still it's not big enough of a deal for them to invite him on to want to actually talk like, to the person. Right, that's what I'm saying. Like that's, person. that's just where disc golf is. That there's not enough. Brody, do you think if it would have been somebody who had been more willing to put themselves out there and someone who, he doesn't even do disc golf interviews, really. Like, if it would have been someone more, do you I, think I, the end they could, could have got any traction? I have, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a fascinating. Like, I haven't actually thought about that, but it is a fascinating thing because it did get picked up by a lot of sports mm -hmm. media, a ton, yeah. But no one actually, and and that's really at the at the end of the day, like sports only really grow when you have people that you care about and watch. Like the reason why college football and college sports will never die out is because a lot of people go to college and a lot of people are die hard for their college. So they always tune in. So no matter I graduated in 2010, I still try to watch as much Florida football as I possibly can. To me, like that also exists in disc golf as well. You got to get people to care about like Lance Armstrong, I was waking up at four o'clock in the morning to watch the tour de France. 
because of Lance. Like he, I connected with him in a certain way that made me want to watch him. Lance Armstrong might be the, I, he might be the best example of a guy really like getting people to watch cycling. Sorry. Yeah. Cycling. That's mm-hmm. pretty crazy. That's, I will, I'll say that, yeah. but that, when people got behind him, like, I don't know, like, the problem is like with cycling. That was kind of USA already, too a little bit. That yeah, was there's kind of a little... so many people that cycle that like okay Nike can get behind him because we know we can sell stuff because people cycle. Like there has to be money in like there has to be enough people in the sport to where there's money mm-hmm. sitting in the sport to, to, for people to want to get behind things. Like yeah, the, so, I was talking to someone the other day that is kind of out of the disc golf world, and I was like, the one super advantage that golf has over disc golf is so many other athletes, so many other sports, so many business people, so many people use that as a perfect way to get together and like share. Like that's a, that's the perfect sport to kind of combine other athletes, business, whatever you want. And like, I, I don't know. Disc golf is kind of like, can't like, if you like hiking. Yeah. For sure. Well, like maybe time, we can all show up and play some disc golf. Like, I, you know what I'm saying? It's like, a, it's a way smaller, smaller niche. And I don't well, know how it takes place oftentimes at a country club. Like it, it is just the environment. Like, I mean, I, I was just saying it, it is growing though. Like uh, when me and I, I'm a youth basher, when me and other youth bashers want to hang out and talk about stuff, we go play around disc golf and chat about it. Yeah, the same kind of reasons that execs would go play a round of golf. It's just it's a different class, a different scene. I mean, it's just what we grew up around in college. So that yeah. change is happening. It's going to be slow because we don't have the hundreds, 150 years of history that golf has. Right. Well, it, it also it comes down to accessibility. Once again, it's like yeah. it, it's yeah, also yeah. a lot nicer to get in a golf cart and right. drive around and have right. have someone coming up to give you beverages and right. all the, it's, it, it's, it all comes down to experience but and you can and for example you can go to wild horse and you can play disc golf in a much closer to that that kind of experience like it, it can get there but mm-hmm. yeah it's it's it where is, the money it at. is dangerous the last couple holes because the golfers start coming up on you and they do not care about you but uh um, they do not like you yeah, yeah no I, I i you know I, I think it's one of those things where you use like you dream about it getting massive and i think we have to just kind of be okay with like it's never probably going to get there but we can try to make it the best we can and i think too like getting young kids in it like some of these organizations that are going out to pe classes that are putting baskets into schools to where kids are getting it like that you know to going back to caleb's point like i used to play tennis as a young kid I loved it. Stop playing. There might be someone that comes around that catches my eye that in tennis, that makes me want to go back and play. But if I've never played tennis before, I've never picked up a racket before. And that person exists. It's a lot harder of a barrier for me to want to go out and try to pick up tennis for the first time. So I think getting Frisbees into kids hands early to where it's at least there to where if they have that moment like Caleb does where he's scrolling on YouTube and something pops up and they're like, oh, I remember I used to do that. Like, hey, you guys want to go out and try this? Like, I think that's huge to kind of break down that barrier then trying to get mm-hmm. someone that's never seen it before, never done it before to be like, oh, let's go out to play disc golf and try it. Certainly. A lot of times, too, you're also buying the wrong disc and you suck. And there's very few things that people like to continue to do if they completely well, stuck at it at the so beginning. You, you can also pick out the wrong course as well. That can yeah. be the, the, the difference between a, a difficult, uh, <laughs> like a golf course, at least there's going to be front tees and they're going to be pretty easy at most places. A disc golf course, if you end up at New London versus no, Peak View, Fountain Hills. Court. Fountain Hills, you might be over yeah. after five minutes. You might lose your first all. Hole is a you carry. you yeah. might lose all your disc on hole one, and yeah. you're just like, "All right, that was fun." Yeah, <laughs> it's true. There's there's levels to this game. Um, well, in any case, Gary, uh, you're a champ tonight. Great show though for everybody. Really, that was uh, it was good stuff. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, just want to say, uh, go out and spend some time learning about your local your local disc golf courses and your local disc golf scene. I played a tournament this weekend where it was the the forty third annual. It's been going for 44 years um, with the exception of the COVID year, obviously. And we got to hear about the guys back in the seventies playing disc golf on this property, thinking that they, they didn't know the sport was a professional sport. And then they found out that it was, and just, there's a lot to be learned locally in in your clubs and your courses and appreciate the people who are out there making them. So big shout out to, uh, to Mike Dunkel and and, uh, Charles Greco. 
All right. Shout out. There you go. Well, there's been another episode of Debate Night. And uh, if you enjoyed this one, make sure to leave a like on the video. And also, if you'd like to submit a topic, still some time to get your topics in. You can click the QR or scan the QR code on the screen or click the link in the description. Get those fan submitted topics in. I'm sure you may have heard something uh, even on tonight's show that you want to hear expounded on or you have a rebuttal for it. So throw that in there as well. And we can continue talking about those in the last few weeks of the season. Um, But until then, um, yeah, we'll see you next week with another episode.